Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Envision Coworking, where you'll enjoy a beautiful space and a community of creative and supportive people. Our speaker is Patrick Von Pander. Patrick has coached over 1,000 business people, one-on-one, -on -one, and over 70 corporate leadership or sales teams. As the general manager of Estoris Group, Patrick leads and coaches their growing portfolio of marketing and technology companies. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and give Patrick Von Pander a warm BBN welcome. Thank you, Roger. There are two types of business people in the world when it comes to networking. There are those who are fiercely independent. They wanna do it all themselves and they wanna do it their way. And then there's those enlightened people who understand that it's better to be able to connect with others and build relationships with others and leverage those relationships to do more of the li heavy lifting to be able to get things done that they wouldn't have the ability or capacity to do themselves. I'm Patrick Von Pander, and what I wanna share with you today is a little bit of a story and a lot of the lessons that I've learned over the last 17 years. 17 years ago to this very month, I left the corporate world. I was a client relationship manager at TELUS, having worked there for 14 years in corporate sales and then in client relationship management. I want to share with you what my mentor there at TELUS shared with me. He said, Patrick, as you head out there into the world and do this coaching thing, this business coaching thing that very few people knew really what it was, you're not going to have the big TELUS corporate name and logo available to you as leverage to be able to open doors for you, to be able to have people take your phone calls, to be able to take advantage of opportunities that wouldn't have opened up for you on your own. He said, you will need to build your own powerful business network, your own personal powerful network of contacts and connections. And when you do that, it will be an ultimate tool for leverage for you. You'll be able to do so much more. In fact, with the right network, he said, you'll be able to do anything. And the cool thing about that is that when you build the right network, when you make changes in your life, personally or professionally, that network, because you've built those relationships, they come with you. It is portable. And so he says, Patrick, you're somebody that's proficient in sales and marketing. You know marketing 101 is know who your target market audience is. Who is your target market audience? I was 39 at the time, and I felt I didn't have the chops or the experience quite yet to do the executive and corporate coaching yet. So I chose small business owners and professionals and professional services firms. And so he said, Patrick, that's a good start. Marketing 102 then says, be where they are. Network where they are and get to build those relationships with them. So go to chambers of commerce, boards of trade, go to networking groups like BNI. And keep in mind, 17 years ago, there's a couple of major things that hadn't even emerged yet. Meetup hadn't emerged yet. LinkedIn didn't exist yet. And so against that backdrop, and that those two avenues opened up a few years later, I wanna share with you some of the lessons that, uh, that I learned. So as we go through building your own personal, uh, powerful personal network, maybe you can resonate with the fact that you feel like you wanna make a difference, that you wanna have a really big impact personally and professionally. And that you have limited resources. There's only so much you can do each day, each week, each month. And that you want to achieve much, much more. In fact, achieve more with less. 
what we're going to share, what I'm going to share with you today are a number of strategies. And from those strategies, you're going to be able to choose some of the strategies that maybe are a great fit for you. Doesn't mean you need to do all of them, but I will share with you the more of them you combine, the more synergistic the effect will be. And the more they will complement and build off of one another, which is its own form of leverage and amplification. You'll become a better online networker as I'll share with you what I did to be able to, from the ground up, I was on LinkedIn the very first year, in fact, the eight months after it launched, I was on LinkedIn. And since that time, how I've built a very strong, powerful network of 17,500 plus first level connections and why I did what I did with, uh, with it. So I'm gonna share some of those with, with you. I wouldn't say that I'm a LinkedIn expert, but I will share with you, I've become a very good practitioner. I work with it. And I'll share with you how I've helped or how I've learned to be able to really uh, make the most of live business-oriented, stand-up, mix-and-mingle business networking events. And my, my mentor, at TELUS, he said, go out there, because LinkedIn and Meetup didn't exist yet, go out there to these events. And he knew, I think he knew, that I was a competitive person. So he challenged me, he said, a good idea would be to attend one business networking event every week, 50 weeks a year, for as long as you do this. Then he went on to say, a better option would be to attend two every week. 50 weeks a year for as long as you do this. And the best option, if you can manage this personally, professionally, financially, emotionally, physically, attend three a week. I'm a competitive person and I took that to heart. And over the last 17 years, I've attended on average three business networking events a week, 50 weeks a year for the last 17 years. And I'm gonna share with you what I've learned from those that I now wanna be able to have you benefit from. Does that sound all right? Woo. Let's get started then. Let's start with the top 10 strategies for building your powerful personal network of contacts and connections. First is speak. Look what I'm doing here now. When you're at the front of a room or you're leading or facilitating a group, there's a credibility that comes with that. There's a prestige that comes with that and there is influence that can come with that. Now, when I first started, I wasn't really that comfortable with speaking quite yet. And maybe some of you can really resonate with that. And what I wanna share with you is there's great avenues to be able to pursue to get more comfortable. Yes, I found and joined a Toastmasters group through the Surrey Chamber of Commerce, even before it was the Surrey Board of Trade, I joined a Toastmasters group and belonged to them for two years to be able to learn some of the mechanics of delivering uh, a, a planned speech, like how to write and structure and deliver a planned speech, but also how to be able to think on your feet and table topics and what they do with table topics where you have little or no time to prepare anything and to speak off the cuff for two minutes in front of your fellow uh, members really, really uh, kind of hones your chops when it comes to that. But also you'll learn how to be able to organize and structure a meeting, a proper meeting, an efficient, effective meeting. So I encourage you, if you're feeling any sort of anxiety about that, learn to, to speak and deliver that. Also at the Surrey Chamber of Commerce, I had an opportunity to be able to deliver some presentations and I got my way in to delivering what they called a new member or prospective member orientation session. And not only was that a chance for me to practice my newfound skills, but strategically it was smart because every time there's new members coming into that business community, guess what, I got first access to those. So those can be examples of how speaking can really benefit, uh, benefit you and is one of the 10 strategies. You can participate, just like I participated with the Surrey Chamber of Commerce, I always also got to know other networking groups and there is someone that took me under her wing and taught me how to be a meeting facilitator. And from that, she gave me a, a, a meeting group to facilitate 
And when that went really well, after a number of months, I got a second one, and then later a third one, to the point where over a period of several years, I facilitated six different business meeting networking groups and became a really skillful um, facilitator for knowing how to be able to lead meetings. But you can participate in various different ways. You can participate um, in, in not-for-profit organizations, for instance. Um, there are lots of groups that are looking to have people participate with them. And so in, from a business perspective, you can participate. But also you can participate when it comes to maybe social or cultural uh, things that maybe are of interest for you. I'm a really big believer that networking happens everywhere and all the time where there are people. Whether there's just two or three of you in a small intimate setting, or there's a big giant group that, uh, that is very vibrant. And so think of what you can participate in, in, in alignment with who you are, what you enjoy, and put yourself into environments of other people who are like-minded. Another is to be able to write. Another strategy to build those networks is to write. Now, writing can take various different forms. You can write. Uh, I know that early on, I, being an analytical personality style, I loved um, compiling and or reorganizing information into ways that is easier for people to absorb. Early on in my days as, as a coach, um, I noticed that business, whether it's on the business side or on the personal side, things can get very, very complex, very complicated. And I love taking complex things and simplifying them. And writing played a real role in that for, for me. And so one of the things that I did was I wrote 82 top 10 lists. One of them I'm going to share with you at, at, towards the end, the top 10 ways to work a room. These are information-filled things that can be resources for you to be able to get your credibility, your information out there in a way that will help and assist others. Obviously, you can write, and increasingly, we're getting more and more into the world of, of social networking and online networking uh, through so social networks. And there's great opportunities to be able to write for blogs, for writing posts, to be able to write white papers. So there's lots of opportunities as a strategy for building a network of contacts to be able to write in the online space as well. Create, you've got an opportunity to be able to create things. I mentioned to you how I created 82 top 10 lists, but also after about five, six, seven years, I started noticing the people that I was coaching, there were certain types of business people that had common problems that came up repeatedly. So there were patterns there that I would recognize. And from those, I created coaching programs that would help people either dissolve or eliminate those problems, or even better, to be able to preempt them and really um, avoid them really being experienced, not having uh, them experience those problems from happening in the first place. So you can create, and I created 11 different coaching programs, six for, for business and five actually for personal. And so you've got an opportunity in your space to be able to create some things. And those can translate into the online world as well. At first for me, it was live events, but as more and more of the world and marketing turned to the online world, Again, I reconnected with that whole notion my mentor shared with me that be where they are. Wherever your target market audience is, be where they are. So as more of them were moving online, I wanted to be there as well. And so when you're creating something, allow it to translate into that world as well. Volunteer can be another wonderful way for you to be able to build a network and quality networks as well. Um, I do know from having done my fair share of, of uh, presentations and trainings and workshops and seminars for professional associations and their members, like accountants and lawyers and engineers and so forth, that many of these professional services uh, associations have a requirement for pr uh, continuing professional education credits. And part of what counts for their professional uh, like uh, development credits is to volunteer on not-for-profit organizations. So you can get a very high 
quality and caliber of contact and connection by sometimes volunteering for not-for-profit organizations in their management or in their board of directors uh, arenas, if that is something that is of interest to you and really is in alignment with your target market audience. So volunteer. Volunteer with, with a board of trade or chamber of commerce. Uh, volunteer for, for causes that you really uh, resonate deeply with. Volunteering is a great strategy for this. And there's a lots of different ways to be able to deliver on that. Let's face it, we are in the million channel universe and its name is YouTube. <laughs> and increasingly because so many personality types are resonating with different type of, of, uh, of expressions, uh, different types of communication, whether it's auditory or, or visual or kinesthetic. Video is one of those dynamics that really relays that visual dynamic moving visual element as well as sound in a way that really captures people's attention. And there's a lot of people who are visual visual learners as well as auditory learners. So this plays to all of that. So when you can deliver um, your content and information in a video format that really reaches out and allows you to connect relationally, um, it can be very powerful. I can't tell you how often I've gone to events and people have approached me and have told me that they've seen some of my stuff online in a video format and they feel like they know me already, even though that's the very first time that they have connected with me. It's a powerful dynamic. Where else, where else can you get that? Tap into that if you're comfortable with it. If not, maybe it's an opportunity to be able to get comfortable with it. Um, you know, one thing that I, that I often share with, um, with people who go, to networking, uh, who go to a networking event or are reticent or hesitant about going to a networking event, um, I share with them, you know what? What I know about this networking group is they have a 100% survival rate. No one has died from attending a business networking stand up, mix and mingle networking event that I've been to. Expressing gratitude. This is layered in its power and dynamic. Not only does it put you in a great, headspace and spirit, but when you can show and share appreciation for others for what they're doing, for what Roger has done to build this network, to share and express that appreciation for all the work that's gone into building this into what it is now built into, that's a powerful dynamic. And there's a whole area of marketing now that specifically just focuses on appreciation marketing. Why? because it's powerful and it works. The more you can feel appreciation, the more you're gonna remember somebody who expressed that to you. So be that person that expresses that for others. Those that you build relationships with, they wanna know what's going on with you. I mean, part of the reason why social media has taken off is because there's, an, there's, a, there's a voyeurism aspect that allows them to stay connected with you even if you don't always have the time or the timing to be able to be there to experience what they're experiencing. So update those people who are in your world. They wanna hear from you. They wanna know what's going on. There's also this whole news-driven um, culture that we have tapped into, people don't want to feel like they're missing out. They want to know that they're in the in crowd. They don't like to, to miss out. And so the more you can share an update, uh, the more they're going to feel like, yeah, okay, uh, I know what's going on with, uh, with them and I can connect with, uh, with that. And the next time we do meet or we do talk, uh, we can, we've got something to be able to break the ice with. And, and really uh, foster that communication, deepen that relationship. Phone, as much as we've gotten into, into a texting environment where you know that, uh, that, that smartphone is one where we text or email, the reality is there's still very few forms of communication that have as much impact as the human voice. In deepening those relationships, um, you know, I know when I, when I went through 
many years ago, my university education, they shared with me the percentage of communication through different, uh, different medium. They said only 7%, uh, only 7% uh, of communication happens through the written word. 38% happens through voice and 55% happens through body language. So when you're talking about, about communication and you can't be there in person to share the body language, then you wanna be able to not disconnect completely from allowing people to connect with their, with their voice. Not only that, but in this day and age in the business world, you'll actually stand out a little more because you are reaching out uh, to people through, through the phone. And so smartphones are a great uh, way to be able to stay connected and speak to people. Even if you leave voicemail messages, it counts. People do check their voicemail messages. Maybe not as quickly as the text messages, but they do check them and it counts. And so I like the whole notion of uh, if you don't know the person and what their preferred communication style is, use all of them until they show you what it is they prefer and how they respond. And so don't be afraid to go old school as well when it comes to, uh, to phone. Uh, and no, again, know your target market audience. If your target market audience is of an older generation like baby boomers, I would say even uh, Gen Xers, there's still a relationship not only with phone communication, but there's a relationship with paper. I still have a relationship with paper. So if you're looking to do business with them, you need to do uh, and be flexible enough to do business the way they prefer to do business. That includes different forms of communication. So if they prefer old school phone conversations and live meetings, guess what? If you want their business, you kind of need to play in their patch regardless of whether or not uh, you feel that it's not the modern or efficient or the, uh, the, the up-to-date way. Know your target market audience and be willing to adapt. And then of course, socialize. When we can break bread together and, and we can uh, mix and mingle and get to know each other in a social environment, it's another level of connectivity. You know, there's a special dynamic that comes with meeting somebody for coffee and even a deeper dynamic that still is true for us, virtually all of us, when we break bread together. There's a great opportunity to be able to have lunch meetings or dinner meetings or breakfast meetings with business prospects, with clients, with peers, with suppliers, with customers. So look for opportunities to socialize because there's a connective issue there when food food and drink is involved as well. So remember that. So these are the 10 strategies that I've learned that you can be able to leverage. My suggestion and recommendation is choose those ones that are the right fit. If you're not doing any of them, pick one to start with and then add another one and then add another one after that. And be patient about your time frame in building this up. I didn't build up my network overnight. I took the time. I deployed the strategy of patience to be able to build it over a period of time. The more, as I said earlier, the more you can add these different strategies onto one another, the more they'll have a synergistic amplifying effect on one another and they'll complement one another. So the more of them you can do and pull off, uh, proficiently, the better. Let's, let's head over to the next stretch. Learning how to be able to leverage LinkedIn networking for your business. It's pretty clear that LinkedIn is the social media network for business. Statistically, it's the most powerful one out there. And now that the ownership is for for the ownership arrangement for LinkedIn is what it is. They've got tremendous backing to be able to continue to expand it and integrate it in with Microsoft. And it's a very, very powerful dynamic. So some tips and suggestions. Really focus on your profile first. Have a professional headline. A professional headline that really expresses in brief, brief numbers of words what it is that you're trying to do. 
You know, wh what is it that you're looking to accomplish and achieve? Location and industry matters when it comes to this. And the fewer words you can, you can put in, the better. You know, powerful personal networks, that's a pretty good one, right? Three words. If you can get it to seven words or less and express what you want to say, that can be a really good strategy and a great tip when it comes to building your profile. Use only a professional photo. Get a headshot done or get a photo uh, done that really represents your professional attitude. As a, at the beginning, at the beginning of this presentation, you saw the photo that I used. You'll find that's the photo that I used in my LinkedIn profile. So you don't just want to have a silhouette. When I go on the LinkedIn and I have somebody that is requesting a connection to me and they've got a silhouette, they don't even have a photo up, regardless of whether it's good or not, if they just have the silhouette there, I'm a lot less likely to even take a look at it because they, they aren't taking LinkedIn seriously. They're not taking business seriously. They're not doing the work. I want to work with people who are doing the work and understand the power and dynamic that goes with reciprocity and that this has got to be a mutually beneficial re working relationship. And just have in your photo just you. Don't include your spouse or partner or child or your dog or cat in there as much as you might love them. This is your profile. So focus on that and no one else. And of course, use a current one. You could see the profile photo. You might notice I'm dressed exactly the same. I was saying to my wife this morning, no one can, can, uh, can argue the fact that that photo is recent because still, I still have the same wardrobe. So use that for, for sure. Um, background photo or graphic, dress up or brand your profile and have a background photo that's relevant for what you're doing. If, in your, if, if you're doing Vancouver real estate, maybe have a picture as your background of Vancouver, some sort of iconic picture. If it's something else, if, if you're an artist um, relating to painting or photography, has some, have something there as a background that's expressive or representative of what it is that you're doing so that people can immediately visually identify with who you are. Super important. Make it stand out and, and uh, LinkedIn has a preferred um, set of files and size as well. So be easy to do business with and go with what they recommend. Expand on your headline and be able to write it in a way that explains more deeply, like your headline should um, invite interest and intrigue, but then the body of your profile should, just like a great newspaper or magazine article or good post headline will, will draw you into the body of it. So make sure that it's engaging and decide right up front whether or not you're going to have a first person narrative or a third person and stick with that. Don't change it once or twice or several times within, within your profile. And make sure you check your ego at the door and you make sure that you really highlight your specialties um, and your experience and your accolades. People, especially business people, they don't buy your products. They don't buy into your services. What they buy into is the results that those products or services might give them that they really want. So don't be shy about showcasing your accolades. And if you don't have any accolades, then go about building your portfolio of accolades so that you've got something to show and, and uh, showcase your credibility. Dress it up with writing, expand on that headline, and again, check your ego at the door and avoid maybe industry-related jargon that maybe doesn't appeal to your target market audience or confuses them. That's going to definitely be a turnoff for, uh, for them. And feature what it is that those features and, and, uh, and those specialties are for yourself and customize your URL within your LinkedIn profile. So when you go to LinkedIn, you can not just have that big sort of random number at the end of your profile, but you can have linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash and then tailor the name. My tailored name is the big picture coach at the end of that. So it makes it more uh, memorable. 
easier to be able to find as well. So dress it up a little bit and expand on that headline and tailor it uh, on the writing uh, side of, of the equation. Dress it up then visually, not just in writing, but visually with things like documents, photos. If you have infographics that can be great educational tools that visually explain things that, uh, that you do or results that you help create in a way that fosters understanding more rapidly and quickly and really saves the viewer time, that's gonna let them know that you're really efficient, effective, and focused on what it is that you provide and how you provide it for them. Um, make sure that if you have videos available that can feature what you do, put them up there as well. Again, allow there to be a buffet of visual options available so that they can choose what they prefer to consume. They'll go to what they like best early on or what's a, a great fit uh, for them. Um, if you have posts and articles, make sure that they have a visual um, associated with them as well so that there's an anchor visual that goes with that article or post. If you've got volunteering, put that in there as well. That draws attention. And again, people look for people who are most like them. And so if there's common shared interests, common shared values that you have, it's just another form of connective tissue that makes it easier for them to be able to reach out and ask for what it is that you do and how you do it. And be able to join relevant groups on LinkedIn that, uh, that really reflect either your industry or profession or that relates to the target market audience or audiences that you really serve. Recommendations, skills, and endorsements. So this, this was a bit of a turning point when it was, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, I started noticing that they were implementing, LinkedIn started implementing something called recommendations. And over a period of months, I didn't give it a, really a lot of attention at first, but I was watching. I was watching and what I noticed was more and more people that I would connect with on LinkedIn, they would have one or two or three or four recommendations. These are written testimonials with someone's name and profile um, picture attached to it. So it's got a good amount of credibility to it. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And suddenly I started feeling like if I saw somebody's profile and they had no recommendations, I started wondering, why don't they? Mm, a lot of these other people do. And then I came across one profile and they didn't just have two or three or four or five recommendations. They had 25. And I just kept scrolling up the page and I went, whoa, this is huge. This person's profile stood out in a major way compared to everyone else's. And so I started leaning into it. I started connecting back to my uh, current and past uh, clients and I would ask them for recommendations. I asked them to put it in their own words. I didn't wanna write it for them. I didn't want that to come back on me, to blow back in any way. So I asked them for it and a number of them did. And I can tell you that when somebody visits your LinkedIn page and they see 20, 30, 40 recommendations written by the person who's giving the recommendation with their profile link attached, that's a huge chunk of credibility and that's gonna help you stand out. So a few years after that, they started implementing uh, skills and endorsements. And that one I feel is still useful, but it just doesn't have the same credibility as recommendations because it's not somebody actually taking the time to write a personal sentence or paragraph about how great you are. And by the way, I'm a big believer that someone else bragging about how great you are is 10 times more powerful than you doing it for yourself. So ha leverage, leverage that. And I think it's important to have um, a skills and endorsements, but the priority, the primary priority ought to be recommendations. Focus on that and build an impressive inventory. Be that impressive standout profile that makes everyone else's profile by comparison seem a little light. 
personalized invitations. So when you're looking to connect or reconnect with somebody, the detail in the message should be really, really short. So don't, when you're first initiating contact, you're looking to reach out and request a connection with somebody else that you're not first level connected to already, make sure you're not just using the default because that's really easy to, to spot. And it comes across as lazy. It doesn't build the relationship the same way. Personalize it in some way. Maybe have checked their profile. I take, I take a minute or two or five to check out their profile and maybe pick out one or two tidbits that I then go in and, and ask or a reference in my reach out connection request to them. Something that maybe builds that relationship and rapport, lets them know that I went to the effort of it and maybe there's sort of a kindred uh, sharing of uh, experience or there's, uh, there's a connection point that, uh, that, that will increase the likelihood that they'll accept your connection request. Make it personalized and don't make it really, really long-winded either. Um, and let them know what's in it for them to be able to connect. You know, maybe they're in a community that you've got deep connections with and you can add some value for them. Or maybe there's some sort of, of, um, of hack or information that you can give them, some sort of insight that will allow them to benefit from, uh, from that, that will showcase that you're a good person to be able to connect with. Share with them what is in it for them. Maybe it's an opportunity to collaborate. Maybe it's, it's uh, facilitating connections. I know that at some point when my, when my um, first level connections reached around the eight to 10,000 mark, I started noticing a, a decided difference in the number of people that were looking to connect with me as opposed to me connecting uh, and requesting connections with others. And so I started being a little more particular with who I would connect with, um, but I'd, I'd be very conscious about whether or not there's an opportunity to be able to collaborate. And so that is um, something that you wanna be able to include in, in those types of messages. And as was mentioned earlier in our meeting, the gold is really in the follow-up. Be opportunistic during networking events. As uh, most of you here in the room realize, there's a couple of really great, or one in particular, but there's a couple of really great strategies that when you've got your smartphone with you and you have LinkedIn, there's great ways to be able to connect with the other person uh, right there on the spot. You can either do it on a proximity basis or you can use it on a QR code basis if you know where to find it and instantly allow one phone to read the other uh, phone's uh, LinkedIn um, QR code and be able to download and make that connection request right away. It's, uh, it's super. It's in real time and it showcases your proficiency and it's, it, it, it really um, diminishes the amount of follow-up that you have to do a little bit later on. Um, follow-up after networking events and after meetings. When I've had meetings, I look to follow up with them within, within 24 to 48 hours. It's a good strategy to be able to, uh, to, to leverage. And 80% of business happens within the 12th, fifth of the 12th communication. So you wanna be able to follow up with people if you're looking to either connect with them because they can connect you with prospects and customers or um, they are prospects or potential customers. And business is always about what's next. So always set up, what's our next step? What's our next step? When are we gonna connect with next? What are we gonna do next? And finally, this is probably the most compelling mindset that I took into this strategy to build out the massive LinkedIn um, connection network that I, that I have is I took the philosophy that LinkedIn, my LinkedIn profile is my child. If I want my child to be big, I need to feed it every day, just like you would feed your child. Those of you that are in the room or out there in YouTube land that have children, would you skip a day feeding your child? Probably not. My LinkedIn profile is my child. I feed it every day by reaching out to make new contacts and new connections every day. If you want your child to be strong, you want to exercise it every day as well. 
for me, LinkedIn exercise is communication, is communication, communicating with your LinkedIn contacts and connections, either one-on-one -on -one or as a community, as often as possible. If you wanna be a good parent to your LinkedIn profile, feed and exercise it every day, every day. Let's switch gears a little bit. Top 10 ways to work a room. I wanna share with you, first of all, a little bit of an insight. There have been surveys done that share that 40% of everyone feels a level of social anxiety when they come into a social networking event. That figure jumps up to over 80% when the majority of people in that room are strangers to you. So for those of you that felt anxiety coming into this room today, or those of you out there in YouTube, that feel anxiety about going to a stand-up business networking, mix and mingle networking event, I want you to know that when you walk into that room, most everyone in that room is feeling some level of what you're feeling. At the same time, you wanna understand regardless of whether or not you're a proficient, experienced networker, or it's the first time you've ever gone to a stand-up business networking, mix and mingle networking event, everyone there is there for one purpose, and that is to make new contacts and connections. I come in with the mindset of having a goal. Depending on how much time there is in the, in the networking event, if it's a 90 minute or, or 120 minute, two hour networking event, I'll have a goal of eight or 10 or 12 new contacts or new connections I will have as a, as a goal to, to hit. For me, 10 minutes gives each person a chance to be able to have five minutes to unpack who they are, what they do, who they do that for, and maybe a little bit about how they do that and give you a sense of whether or not they're somebody that you wanna connect with. So with that, let's dive right into top 10 ways to work a room. Now the first three happen even before you get to the room. You get one chance to make a good first impression and you wanna make sure that you have enough business cards with you because when somebody asks you for a business card and you don't have one, your first chance to make a first impression is gone. You didn't come prepared or prepared enough. So have, have enough business cards at the ready for that. One of the things that I do to make sure that I can hack this is I have little stashes of business cards all over the place. I have some in my favorite networking suit jackets. I have some in my folio, my binder. I have some in my wallet. I have some in the glove compartment of my vehicle because sometimes, you know, you just rush out the door and they were there on the counter, on the desk counter, or the kitchen counter, and you forgot to pick them up on the way out. So have, be a good boy scout or girl guide and be able to be prepared. Have enough business cards at the ready. If possible, have a name tag. Have a name tag. Having a professional name tag is the best, but at events, as you can see with the graphic here, there's a lot of networking events that provide you one. And I suggest and recommend that you put it on your right side. And here's why you do that. Surveys have been done and they show that when you shake hands, and by the way, which hand do we shake with? Right hand. Sorry, lefties, you're only 11% of the population, majority rules, and so we're gonna shake with right hands. And when we shake with our right hand, which side are we relating to with that other person? It's their right side. So between that and the fact that we here in North America scan from left to right, it'll get noticed earlier, remembered longer, especially for those that are visual learners. The third is Act as if you belong there. Like I said earlier, everybody is there to make new contacts and connections. Act as if you belong. Even if I'm walking into a room, to a group where maybe a quarter or a third or even half the room knows me, the reality is I want to meet the people who I've not connected with. And if you don't show up, there's a, there, you've missed an opportunity. I've missed an opportunity for you not being there. 
I've not had an opportunity to be able to connect with you and you haven't, you haven't had an opportunity to connect with me and, and my network of contacts and connections. It's a missed opportunity, so act as if you belong. Step number four, make an entrance. It's a proven fact that in almost any social situation in a big room that between one quarter and one third of everyone in the room are door watchers. They love to see who's coming and who's going into the room. This is part of the reason why in European history at the large balls and, and, and palatial uh, parties, and even in the deep south where they would have cotillions, they would have somebody that actually announces you at the front of the room, at the entrance way. Now, most networking events, they don't provide you with that level of service, but you want to tap into the strategy of those people who are door watchers. So when you walk into the room, unless you've got a whole lineup of people waiting to get into the room behind you, when you first walk into the room, let that first impression be a good one. Stand up tall, straight, confident, smile, and just scan the room and allow the room to scan you, to notice you. Take a three count, take a five count, take a 10 count before you head on into the room. Let the room notice you. Number five, don't rush right over to the bar or to the buffet table or food table. To the experienced networkers that are there to build networks, that tells them in no uncertain terms, that's your priority, is to feed and water yourself. And it takes away time from you being able to do the quality networking. So me, I prefer to use it as a goal. I prefer to have it be a reward for hitting my goal target of meeting eight, 10, 12 new people. That's my reward. I get to then earn my way to the bar or the buffet table, to the food table. What you do want to do, number six, is you do want to greet the host or, and or the major sponsor of the event. There's three reasons why you want to be able to do this. Number one, expressing gratitude for their having organized the event. Organizing events are a big, ugly job very time consuming. The amount of effort that goes into organizing events is huge. So to have a host or sponsor who puts so much into the networking event be shown appreciation makes them feel great. By the way, it makes you feel great too and puts you in a very positive mindset for the rest of the event. And the third reason why you wanna do it is it's very likely that that host or that sponsor is very connected into the room and either knows who's there already or knows who's coming. And the sooner they get to know who you are, what you do, who you do that for, the sooner they may be able to connect you with other people that are in the room or are gonna be arriving. Smart strategic approach. So do greet the host, seek them out, share your appreciation for what they've done here then move on into the event. Then it comes to who do you approach? Who do you approach? Now there's this big room or maybe a small room or maybe a massive room of people. Who do you approach? Rule of thumb is you want to approach those people who are standing on their own or in groups of three or more. Please, please don't be that person who blows up a very focused, intimate, strategic one-on-one -on -one conversation. Can't tell you how many times I've had a great one-on-one -on -one conversation where I was just about to be able to set up a meeting with that person or to be able to have some, something exchanged in terms of information and somebody's barged their way into the conversation and blown up the flow of conversation. Don't be that person because that isn't the person that's gonna be um, having the other two people feel goodwill towards them. I'm not going to feel goodwill to them if they just blown up something that I've worked five or 10 minutes to that's a follow-up for those. So look for those, those people that are standing in groups of three or more because they've already got a group dynamic going. For you to slide in is no big deal in that group dynamic. 
or approach people that are standing on their own. There's a couple of exceptions here to these rules, by the way. People who are standing on their own, who are either filling their face with food or drinking double-fisted, <laughs> or they've got their backs to the room, giving obvious body language that they're not looking to connect or network right now, that's an exception. Also, those people that are paired up and one person is talking, 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 and the other person is looking around for an escape route that they can't seem to find or somebody to rescue them, that may be an exception. And in that instance, if you're a strong enough network networker, you may choose to rescue that person and then circle back and reconnect with them later on in that event. Take one for the team. Those are the two exceptions I've experienced. But those are the people that you want to approach. Number eight, first impressions. Well, let me ask you a question. When you first meet somebody you've never met before, how do you know whether or not they're going to respond most strongly to auditory, to visual, or kinesthetic? The real answer is you don't. So that first impression ought to be a multimedia experience. Visually, you should be dressed for the event, for your profession or business. You should wear something else that is very inviting. And what would you say that is? What's the most, smile. A smile is most inviting. Smile when you're approaching someone. That's inviting, wear that smile. But don't just smile with your mouth, smile with your eyes. Smile with your eyes as well. Then make sure you've got that, that good um, kinesthetic experience as well, a good solid handshake. Not Arnold Schwarzenegger crushing hand kind of uh, handshake, but not limp noodle, you know, handshake either where it doesn't, you don't really feel if anything's there. Or maybe the weirdest one of all that I've experienced a few times is if any of you kind of noticed that sometimes people just catch the ends of your fingers. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Honestly, when you experience that, please do yourself a favor and go back, make light of it, go, you know what, we can do better. Let's try that again and go back. Because otherwise, I don't know about you, but all I can think about is this is weird handshake person, right? And that's rolling around in my head and that's what I'm gonna remember them for. So don't be that, let it be a good experience and make light of it and move on. And the third is you want that auditory expression. Those first few words and sentences out of your mouth to be pitch perfect. You know when you've met somebody and they are very, very clear on what they do and they're confident in the way that they deliver that. Hi, my name is Patrick, Patrick Von Pander. I'm the big picture coach. I help my clients fill their business with profitable clients. What is it that you get to do? and immediately put the spotlight on them. I want to hear their story. I want to set it up for them so that they're comfortable sharing what they do, who they are, but introduce myself briefly and set that up. But have that down so that there's no stumbling. It just rolls off. Did that seem confident to you when I delivered it? Did it seem clear about what it is that I do? I want that for you as well, so do that. Be sure that you've got that down. And by the way, you all, at least all of you that have a vehicle, you all have the studio to be able to practice that so that it just flows out. Practice it 100 times, 500 times, 1,000 times if you need to, but let it roll off your tongue like a reflex. Use your vehicle to practice that. It's a great studio costs you nothing more. Let your first impression be that multimedia experience, visually, auditory, and kinesthetic. And keep your hand shaking hand free. If and when you earn your way to the bar or the buffet table, use your left hand. Use your left hand to hold your drink or to hold your food because there's nothing more embarrassing when it comes to making a good first impression than somebody tapping you on the shoulder and saying, Patrick, I would like to introduce you to the president of, and you turn around 
and you've been holding a drink and now you've got a cold, wet, clammy hand. And that's gonna be the first impression. By the way, doing this on your pants or skirt doesn't really do a lot for first impressions. Or if you're holding greasy finger food or that sticky, you know, pastries, those desserts, don't let that be the first impression. So keep your right hand, your shaking hand free during the whole experience. And then when it comes to having a conversation with the person, let NBC guide you. And I don't mean the TV station, NBC. I mean, navigate by curiosity. Don't be in a rush to tell your whole story. In networking events, what I find overwhelmingly to be the case is that everybody wants to get their story out. And if I'm giving and unpacking my whole story, guess what the true mindset is for most of the people I'm speaking to on a one-on-one -on -one basis. They're wondering, am I gonna get my chance? Am I gonna get my chance? Am I gonna get to tell my story? Am I gonna get to tell my story? They're not paying attention to me nearly as deeply or as meaningfully as they could. So when I give them the spotlight first, it allows them to be able to tell their story. And most of the time, the really quality networks, they will give you a chance to be able to tell yours. By the way, I use it as a bit of a sorting strategy as well. For those that only want to talk about themselves, and you will find that out there in networking events, or you start to tell your story and they circle back to talking more about themselves again, that's a good indication, at least for me, and this is just my opinion, that that person really doesn't understand mutually beneficial relationships and that the best relationships in business and in life are reciprocal. So I'm not as likely to be able to connect with them. And so I wrap up the conversation with them, that, that eight to 10 to 12 minute conversation, always the same way to start. I will ask for their business card. May I have your business card? I don't wanna dominate all of your time at this networking event. There's lots of opportunity for you to be able to connect with others. May I have your business card? That's what I say when I don't wanna follow up with them because they're not a prospect or not a, not a connector who can connect me with prospects. The one differential I will make is that if I do wanna connect with them and follow up with them, and typically my statistics are that out of the eight, 10, 12 that my goal is, if I hit that goal, typically two or three or four of them are worthwhile following up with, either as prospects for my business or as connectors that, connect, that can connect me with those who can connect me with business. And so the one difference I make with them is I ask them for their business card. I let them know that I really enjoyed this conversation and I would love to be able to continue it with you another time. Would it be okay if we reconnected over coffee or a phone call or a Zoom or Skype call? Would that be okay? And either they're okay with it or they're not. And most of the time they are. So that showcases the top 10 ways to work a room. I hope this has been useful for you. And the more of these things that you can incorporate and do, the more comfortable and confident you're gonna be, the more success you're gonna have at working the room like a pro and be able to build those relationships um, even in a live setting and not just online. So my name is Patrick, Patrick Von Pander. I am the big picture coach and have been a master certified business coach, professional speaker and trainer for the past 17 years. Over 70, closer to 80% of my business is working with solo professionals and professional services firms to help them fill their business practice with profitable clients. And the other thing I do is I do keynote presentations and conferences for, um, for companies and corporate events. So who do you know that uh, may want me to deliver on a variety of topics? I've got a menu of topics that, uh, that they have to choose from. I'd love to be able to hear from them and be of service for them and either their staff or their members or their communities. For those of uh, you out there in YouTube land, I have an offer for you. And that is uh, if you wanna connect with me for your complimentary, your free 30 minute discovery sessions, please visit the link um, in this slide and, and uh, book yourself in 
for a complimentary introductory um, business coaching session. And I look forward to uh, connecting with you soon. Thank you so much.